All right, let's take up some more evidences that this Earth is not billions of years old. And welcome to the new visitors here at our class. You're in class number nine. You already missed the first eight, but uh, that's all right. Uh, we're covering my basic seminar, creation science uh, seminar, in much more detail. Chasing every rabbit, kicking every dog. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, what about this? We're going to take up one of the evidences for a young Earth is languages. Now, language in general is a really tough thing for an evolutionist to explain. There's a whole part of the brain that humans have. The brain has little folds in it. They're called convolutions. One section of the brain is called Broca's convolution. B-R-O-C-C-A, I believe his name was spelled. Broca's convolution has to do with speech. If a person's brain is damaged and the Broca's convolution is damaged, they will no longer be able to speak. Uh, it has to do with speech and speech recognition, I believe, but maybe some doctor can tell us that, but I don't care. Uh, the fact is, monkeys don't have this. There's a whole section of their brain that's missing called Broca's convolution. And you'll never teach a monkey to talk. They got the one gorilla to do a few things, you know, sign language things, but it's basically conditioning is what it is, you know. Roll over, speak, sit. Same glorified dog is what it amounts to. But human speech is fascinating. We can, just with sounds, indicate all sorts of things that we believe and think, and you can tell a person's uh, mood by the way they're talking to you, you know, when they're angry at you, when they're happy, when they're excited. Uh, the oldest major systems of writing down words, now not, not only speech is unique to humans, uh, but writing, a written verbal communication where a symbol means something is unique to humans, indicating no evolution. But uh, the major systems of writing appeared in several spots around the world, according to National Geographic 1999. They said the Maya Indians, M-A-Y-A Indians, uh, had a system of writing. Mesopotamia, which is basically where Baghdad is today, the valley. Uh, Levantine, Egyptian, Indus Valley, and Chinese. So they're saying there are six places where writing originated. I would say, yes, maybe. I'm not sure about six, but if Noah's kids got off the ark and spread out around the world, he got intelligent people. They're already 100 years old when the flood's over. Okay? They lived with Dad for 100 years. Noah was 600 years old when the flood was over. 601. These guys had incredible knowledge from the pre-flood world. I mean, they were living to be 900 before the flood came. So this incredible knowledge is going to be quickly passed on to the next generation. And you don't need, you don't need to reinvent the wheel now. Because all kinds of things are already known, and so civilizations would develop extremely quickly. You get a few dozen people, maybe a hundred people, that take off and say, hey, we're moving over this way, we're going to start a village. Well, man, they can in five years have a nice village up and running, because they have all this knowledge already. You don't need to teach them how to melt the rocks and get to iron, they already know how. They just got to find where the ore is and go dig it out. And we've seen this over and over, you look at like Swiss Family Robinson or Gilligan's Island, so that's a lousy example. They're kind of stupid. And really no. Pe intelligent people can go into a totally uninhabited area and develop a civilization in a, in a flash. If you get a few hundred people moving to an area, man, it doesn't take long. They, when the pioneers come out west, you know, they clear the land, plant the trees, you know, plant the crops, and build their log cabins, and, you know, pretty soon, within a couple of years, they've got a school and a post office and a church. And it doesn't take long to develop a civilization. So all of the early civilizations, the Egyptians and the Mayans and others, just sprang into existence from almost nowhere. Well, from a Christian perspective, <clears throat> this makes perfect sense. They got off the ark, 42400 BC, started spread out around the world, and by, by 2100 BC, there are thriving civilizations. <clears throat> In just 300 years, incredible civilizations had developed. Well, there's a type of cuneiform writing they would do back then, was uh, pressing their letters or symbols on clay tablets. You get a piece of clay, which you can find along any creek bed, you know, you smash the clay into the shape you want, carve on there what you want, let it bake in the sun for a couple hours or a couple days, and man, you have got absolutely permanent record. They would also do clay cylinder seals, where they would carve it in the shape of a cylinder, and carve these words on there, and then you roll it across another piece of clay. We've got several cylinder seals here in the museum. Uh, Nathan, do you know where they are? Are they in this? Little cylinder seals, so they out here in yeah, one of the display windows. Yeah, I'm not sure. You've seen them, though, right? Play cylinder seals. Some of them show dragons on them, or dinosaurs, you know, on cylinder seals. We'll get into more of that later. But uh, according to National Geographic here, the Mesopotamian cuneiform is from 3200 uh, BC to AD 75. 
Well, I would question the 3200 BC. I would say more like 2400 BC from the time of the flood. But there's no question what we would call ancient man 4,000 years ago had very complex writing systems. And the ancient languages are actually much more complex than our languages today. You, you can even look what we've lost in the last 400 years. The average person walking down the street in Shakespeare's time, you know, King James English, uh, the average person walking down the street had a working vocabulary of about 20,000 words. They knew the meaning of about 20,000 words. Today, the average person walking down the street has a working vocabulary of about 5,000 words. Kids have just a few words to describe things. Wow, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Man. Think of something else to say, would you? <laughs> Uh, the, our vocabulary is so limited, which is a sign of declining uh, education and everything else. According to World Book Encyclopedia, the first developed systems of word writing appeared only about 5,000 years ago. Now, question. If man has been here for millions of years, isn't it strange that the oldest writing is only 5,000 years old? Of course, I would question that. I'd say more like 4,400 years ago, you know, the flood, and they said, no. But getting off the ark, they knew how to write. Noah actually wrote part of the book of Genesis. Noah's son Shem wrote part of the book. There are ten different authors to Genesis. We'll get into more of that later. According to G.G. Uh, G. Simpson, George Gaylord Simpson, he was a very famous evolutionist back in the 50s and 60s. He wrote a book, uh, an article for Science Magazine called The Biological Nature of Man, and he said, the oldest language that can reasonably reconstruct it is already modern, sophisticated, complete. Now why would an evolutionist say something like that? The oldest languages we can find are already really modern. See, he's got the totally wrong philosophy of life. He believes in evolution. But I've asked evolutionists the question over and over, where, when, and how did language evolve? Is, did our language evolve from the grunts and groans of animals and apes? Now, there, there's such a difference. It's like many orders of magnitude of difference between our language and the grunts and groans and squeals of animals. It's just, there's no comparison. Um, and even evolutionists have never had an answer for how language could have evolved and how word writing could have evolved. When you look at the oldest calendars, this is another indication the Earth is not billions of years old. Uh, the Chinese calendar uh, has the year 2000 as 4700. Which would, you know, the Bible dates would go back 4,400 years, so it's only 300 years off from the biblical dates. Which raises a couple of questions. Is theirs accurate, you know, number one? Or did they start with Noah's birth instead of Noah's time on the ark? Why would you start with the flood? Why not start with the birth of Noah? Or maybe the birth of Shem? Shem is the father of the Chinese. Most Bible scholars would agree with that. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the son of Noah. Well, if Shem is the father of the Chinese and Oriental people, and he was 100 years old when the flood started, Shem would have been born about 4,500 years ago. So it's only a couple hundred years off. Why would the Chinese calendar have such a date? You know, If man has been here for millions of years, why not some other number? It's just kind of interesting, a bit of trivia, that it seems to indicate the Bible is exactly correct. Uh, it's a good uh, article of... Uh, Brokersys.com, the whole big law article here, about calendars. There are all kinds of different calendars used around the world. Uh, many of the uh, ancient cultures had calendars that are actually more accurate than our calendar today. Our calendar today, you know, we got several months with 30 days, and some with 31, and some with only 28, and then every four years it's got 29, but every 100 years you don't have the 29th day in there. We have a leap year every four years, and every 100 years we don't have the leap year. But every 400 years, we do have the leap year. And even then, our calendar is not right. You got, it's always got to make up these little things. Some had 30, month, 30 days to a month, and every so many years, they would add another month in there to make it come out just right. Because technically, the Earth goes around the sun in 365.2422. They say it's 365 and a quarter days. Well, it's not exactly a quarter. It's .2422. 2422. It's a little bit less than a quarter of a day to go around the sun. Who cares? Well, over a long period of time, that'll make a big difference. Which is why we have a leap year every four years, but we don't have it every hundred years. And then we do have it every 400 years. So it's a long time. Even then, like I said, there's problems with it. But 
on History Channel last year, they had an article, uh, they ran a deal about capital punishment, you know, all the different types of capital punishment used around the world. But they made an interesting comment, and I doubt they knew I was going to use it in my seminar, they wouldn't have made it. But they said the oldest recorded example of capital punishment is from the 18th century B.C. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says Noah got off the ark about 4400 B.C. Or 2400 B.C. Uh, that'd be 4400 years ago. You mean for millions of years nobody did anything wrong and other people had to be gang up on them and kill them? There was no capital punishment? Isn't it strange that the oldest recorded examples of capital punishment would fit well within the Bible teaching of the earth being created 6,000 years ago and a flood 4,400 years ago? To me, it's just another one of those hundreds of indicators that the Bible is absolutely right. I suspect right after the flood, when they started building civilizations, the greatest punishment you could give somebody would be banishment. I mean, everybody's been working awfully hard to build a city and get a flour mill going so they can grind the corn, and you know, it takes a lot of work to build a whole city. And some guy's acting up, and instead of locking him up in jail where you all got to feed him, you say, look, get out of here, don't come back. What am I going to do? You should have thought of that before you, you know, did whatever you did. You know. Banishment would be a punishment. Uh, but all this capital punishment from you know, you know, executing somebody from 3,800 years ago, to me, fits about the line. The oldest known cultures using agriculture are less than 5,000 years old. Now, the books in school are going to tell you that uh, you know, man developed from a hunting and gathering society to a you know, agricultural society, and this took place. We slowly evolved in an agricultural society. All that's baloney. Okay? Um, we, people came right from here. Cain and Abel's uh, a good example. Cain was a uh, tiller of the ground. He was already an agricultural society. Adam's son, okay? Abel's a keeper of sheep, a, herd, a herdsman. Uh, Tubal Cain, the grandson of Adam, was an artificer of brass and iron. Uh, Jab Jubal, Jab Jabal, Jubal, Jubal, Jubal uh, was already doing musical instruments. So they had arts and stuff like that back 4000 BC. People started off incredibly smart and got worse from there. They didn't start off dumb and get better from there. We've lost a lot. The Hebrew calendar has, uh, the year 2000 was the year 5760. Now their calendar starts in uh, April. April 1st is actually the beginning of the year on the Hebrew calendar. But uh, 2000, this is 5760. The Jewish calendar is, is from the work of uh, Rabbi Yose ben Halafta, who died in 160 AD. He was studying the prophecies of Daniel and realized they pointed directly to Jesus Christ. He said, man, we can't have that. We don't want people believing in Jesus. So he took 164 years out of the Hebrew calendar when he, as he developed it so that the prophecy in Daniel would point to Simon bar Kachma, some other guy that he wanted to be you know, important. And nobody's ever heard of Simon bar Kachma today. <coughs> but we know the Hebrew calendar has been tampered with, but if you add 164 to that, what do you get? 59.24. Plus it's been five years since then. It's now 2005, soon to be 2006. So, 58, 59.31. 59.30. Okay. Let's just assume that no other tampering's been done with the Hebrew calendar. Now, we don't know that, okay? But let's just assume the Hebrew calendar is the accurate one. And this is really the year 59.30 from the creation may not be, I don't know, it may have been somebody else left something out for some reason. But <coughs> the other thing you have to consider, they often use 360 days as a year instead of 365.2422. So there may be other factors involved in making a calendar different from real time. But some have argued that the Lord's coming back in the year, you know, uh, in the year 6000 from the creation. Could be. I mean, that would give us about 70 years left. I don't know how much time we have till the Lord comes, and I'm sure not going to set a date and sell my clothes or stand on a mountain. But uh, I think we probably don't have much. However, the mark of the beast prophecy concerns me. It is technically possible to fulfill that today. We have little microchips that can be injected in your hand or your forehead, and you, know, you can't buy or sell without it. That could be done today. But I really think we've probably got 20 or 30 or 40 more years until the Lord comes back. I think we're going to see times get real tough on Christians. Incredible persecution of Christians here coming soon. Uh, the Saxons in England had a genealogy going back to Adam. 
Kevin, are you in English? Uh, yes, yes, partially, yes. Party English, okay. I'm oh, sorry, I'm excited. Um, the book After the Flood by Bill Cooper is incredible. If you want to study genealogies and all the neat things, have you read those books? That's an awesome book. Uh, Bill Cooper lives in England, I believe, and is pretty sick with cancer if he didn't die. He's last I heard, he was in very serious health, but I never met him, but I know him. But uh, he did a lot of great study on the genealogies. The Danes, the Danish from uh, Denmark, and the Norwegians, there you go, my turn, uh, King List, go back to Noah. One of the great kings in this Danish uh, king list is Beowulf. You might also want to read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Go to any internet, go to Google and type in Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's very interesting. They kept the chronicle. They had major events that happened every year, all the way through. Like in, I think it was 790 AD, which would be, what, 1400 years ago, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it says they had sort of a plague with all kinds of fiery flying serpents that came flying across uh, and really harass the people. It's really interesting reading, an Anglo Saxon part. Berkeley University, of all places, has it posted on their website. It's berkeley.edu. something. Just go to uh, uh, Google and type in Anglo Saxon Chronicle. The Egyptian king lists are greatly exaggerated. Uh, Corville did a lot of research on this in 1956, and there's a book called The Evolution of Cruncher, which has lots of good stuff in there. It's a 900 page book, it's only five bucks. I really recommend you get one of those. But uh, the Egyptian king list was greatly exaggerated. Uh, you got to think, these guys exaggerated all kinds of things. <coughs> this Pharaoh, the greatest guy that ever lived, and they built these huge castles to bury him in, you know, the pyramids. So there's a lot of problems with the Egyptians. So the atheists will always point out, well, we've got Egyptian calendars that go back to, you know, 7,000 B.C. That proves the Bible's wrong. No, that proves their calendar's wrong. It okay, doesn't prove the Bible's wrong. All right, any more questions about... Uh, Ancient calendars, ancient art, or, uh, languages, and stuff like that. These are both good evidences that the Bible is correct. As far as the earth not being billions of years old. So I ask people the question, why are the oldest reliable historical records less than 6,000 years old? Now I have a footnote down there. Anytime you see an asterisk on my uh, PowerPoint, it means there's some notes underneath. Let me just check and see what we've got here. Oh, I was just mentioning about Corville research. Okay. I put a lot of stuff there. The Bible teaches 6,000 years ago God made everything. 4,400 years ago there was a flood that destroyed everything. I don't know of anything from space or earth science or life science that would discredit that. It all fits perfectly fine. The evidence for a young earth is overwhelming. In my humble, totally unbiased opinion on the top. The kids are never shown that. Students are not told the earth is young. All they're ever shown is evidence that the earth is billions of years old, and I think I know why. These books aren't really books about science anymore. They're books about evolution. If they were science books, I mean, evolution has nothing to do with science. You could take out all the evolution junk and teach more science and get a lot more done in the year. I debated a professor in California one time, and I was mentioning, you know, the different lies in the textbooks, and said this ought to be taken out, this ought to be taken out. Finally, he sort of, I think it's debate number 14, 15, 16, uh, maybe you guys remember this one, Dr. McGrath from Southern California. He said, well, what do you want me to teach? I said, teach biology. Man, you know probably all sorts of biology. You're a biology PhD. Teach the kids the muscles, the bones, the, you know, the organs, the functions. Forget the origin stuff. It's unnecessary. Even if evolution's true, it's a waste of classroom time. It's an absolutely useless theory. There isn't a doctor on this planet that worries about evolution when he's doing surgery on somebody. You better hope he studied his stuff and knows where to put your stomach back in at, you know. <laughs> you better hope he knows a little bit of anatomy. It's useless. You do nursing, is that right? No. If I was a nurse in the class. No. Um, they don't worry about that. You just better worry about, you know, if you learn your anatomy and your biology. Evolution's a useless theory. But, I believe this evolution theory is taught heavily in our schools because it's part of a much bigger plan toward a new world order. The founding fathers who started this country had a philosophy. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Where do rights come from? They come from the creator. 
But if you get a bunch of guys together who believe that, they don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. And so there are some people who would like to have a one world government with a thousand points of light, you know. And they just don't, they can't tolerate people believing in creation. I met today for five more hours with the county attorneys. They're trying to close our ministry down because we didn't get a permit to build our building. Okay? They don't understand the basic concept of rights come from the Creator. They don't come from government. See, there are two basic philosophies of government. Creation and evolution. If God's the Creator, then He makes the rules. He decides right from wrong. And He establishes you know, how we're supposed to handle each other. And he gave us all kinds of rules in the Bible about, you know, what type of government to have. But if evolution is true, then man gets to decide. We just look around and all vote on, hey, which way is the wind blowing? Oh, let's go this way, okay? Man decides. These guys in 1776 said, you know, rights come from the Creator. King, you don't have the right to do what you're doing. See, back then they taught what's called the divine right of kings. He's the king, so he's got the right, you know. Um... But there are some guys who would like their one world government, their new world order, and guys like me do not fit in. And probably they will at some time in the future take me out for some excuse, you know. We've got to get rid of Hovind because he doesn't believe in evolution. But it goes way beyond that. I believe rights come from the Creator. Give me an example. Well, it's right here. In 1950s, Lyndon Johnson was governor of Texas, if I have the stories right, I believe I do. And the Texas pastors were giving him fits because he was a wicked man. And they'd get up in their pulpit and they'd say, oh, he's a whore and he's an adulterer and don't you vote for him and blah, blah, blah. And it was really hurting his political ambitions. And so Johnson pushed for this Internal Revenue Code. This is my understanding of what happened, okay? 501c3. Anybody ever heard that before? 501c3? Churches will say, oh, we're 501c3. Read that carefully. 501c3 is a list of exempt organizations, foundations, and established organizations organized and operated exclusively for religious purposes, the church. Sounds good. Restrictions. Oh, no, wait, wait, red flags ought to be going up all over the place. Right, restrictions. You're going to restrict what the church can teach? Oh, yeah. See, Johnson wanted to hush the pastors up. You can get 501c3 and be an exact exempt. But, read this carefully. No part of the net earnings of which issues to the benefit of any private shareholder or individual. In other words, money doesn't go just to the pastor or whatever. No substantial part of the activities of which is carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. That's the part they wanted in there. And which does not participate in or intervene in any political campaign on behalf of any candidate for public office, including the publishing or distributing of statements. In other words, preacher, you can't get up in your pulpit and say, you know, Senator Smith is a much better choice than Senator Jones. You can't do that anymore. Because we don't want the church and the Christian's opinion to matter in all this. So if I have the story right, I'll have to check it out. I believe I do, but... Lyndon Johnson pushed hard to get this passed in 1954. But uh, this was, uh, heck, while he was governor, this was having to do with uh, making churches become an exemption. And 99.999% of the churches in Pensacola are 501c3 organizations. Here's what this means. They have filled out a paper and asked the government for permission to do what God commanded them to do. Think about that. Maybe that doesn't bother anybody, but that bothers me. Like, wait a minute. Why didn't Shadrach bow to the image then? I mean, you read through your Bible, you see all kinds of folks that said, no, we're not going to do that. The Church, the early church was persecuted and just suffered incredible tortures because they simply refused to say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar, the Roman Empire, conquered all kinds of other countries. And so they, they absorbed all these new religions into Romanism. No big deal, they can accept them all. They said, look, we, we just conquered you guys, you lost, we won. 
We're your boss. Now, you can keep your gods, keep your religion, but bring a pinch of salt, say Caesar is Lord, and you go on about your business. Christians by the thousands refused to do that and died horrible deaths, you know, thrown to lions, you know, um, torn apart, eaten, just incredible things they did to the early Christians. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Why? They simply refused to say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar will be good citizens, we will work hard, we will make a lot of money for you, okay? We will be loyal, we will never stab you in the back, you, you can count on us, we're good people, but you're not God. Ooh, man, did Caesar get mad at that one. Yes, I am God. No, Caesar, I'm sorry, you're not God. And I think that's what's happened in America. We've got the same type of thing, and it's a little sneakier this time, but we've got a lot of churches have asked the government for permission to exist. I think if you study this out, you see this is a real serious, this is hush money. Pastor, you can tell your people in the church if they make a donation, they can write it off their taxes. They could do that before this was passed. This didn't do anything and shut, shut people up in the pulpit. Now, if a preacher gets up and says, homosexuality is a sin, it's wrong, God hates it, he stands a chance of losing his precious 501c3 status. And there are people getting persecuted or being harassed for saying, look, don't you talk about political issues or we'll jerk your 501c3. The IRS will come in and say, you can't talk about that because you made an agreement. What agreement? 501c3. If you want to be tax exempt, you can't attempt to influence legislation. Well, doesn't that kind of limit where you can't preach the whole counsel of God? Am I missing something here? You can't um, preach against abortion, can you? That's right. You can't, can't preach against abortion. That's a political issue. You can't <laughs> preach against homosexuality. It's hush money, plain and simple. Now, Internal Revenue Code 508. 26 U.S.C., United States Code, Section 26, deals with all the uh, taxes and stuff like that. Internal Revenue Code 508 says, New organizations must notify the Secretary that they are applying for recognition of 501c3 status, except as provided in subsection C. Well, what is subsection C? 508C, paragraph 1, subparagraph A, states, Exceptions. Mandatory exceptions. Subsection A shall not apply to churches. Their integrated auxiliaries and conventions or associations of churches. Now wait a minute. Churches are mandatory exceptions to the tax law. You realize the incredible difference between an exception and an exemption? I ask people all the time, I say, are you exempt from Mexican taxes? They'll say, well, yeah. Oh, so you're Mexican. Well, no. Well, then how can you be exempt? Well, because I don't have to pay Mexican. Oh, then you're not exempt from Mexican. You're an exception to Mexican taxes. Major difference. I'm not Mexican. I'm not under their jurisdiction. They're not. I don't live in their borders. Anyway, that's another long story. You, chase that, you want to chase that rabbit yourself sometime. Same thing goes with who gives the authority to get married? Where does the right to marry come from? From God. Well, about a hundred and some years ago, after the Civil War, the blacks were freed, and some of them decided they wanted to marry whites. And in some southern states, they had a real problem with that. They said, look, it's just enough that you're free, and we've got to look at you, you know, but you're not going to marry whites unless you get our permission, called a marriage license. Now, the word license comes from the word licentious, which means evil, wicked, and vile if you don't get special permission to do it. Okay? How on earth did the state get involved in marriage? I, I performed probably 400 wedding ceremonies in my life. I've done hundred, several hundred of them, probably 400 at least. I ignorantly told the couples, Go down, get a marriage license, after the ceremony, I'll sign it, you sign it, we file it with the state. I did that hundreds of times. I just didn't know any better. I was stupid. Who gives the authority to get married, the state or God? God does. This is, if you read your Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, 
says, you have the right to make a contract. Kevin can say, Brother Hoven, I will come work for you for the rest of my life if you pay me, you know, nine dollars an hour. Okay, Kevin, here you go. Here's your nine bucks an hour. You come work for me. Whatever. We can make a contract if you'd like. And suppose he doesn't come to work and says, hey, where's my money? Well, Kevin, we had a contract. If you work, you get paid. Don't you remember the contract? And then, if he works but doesn't get paid, he can take me to court, and the court can say, uh, you got to pay him the money. Yeah, but that's my money. No, but you made a contract, okay? You can make any contract you want. The right to, the power to contract is unlimited, I believe, the first article 1, section 10 says. So, <clears throat> a marriage license, believe it or not, is a contract. And most people don't know they're getting into one. They are. Uh, Heath, you did a bunch of study on this with Jonathan, didn't you? Didn't the Ohio website say that, uh, didn't it right there? <clears throat> what is it, the Ohio website? <laughs> uh, I can't remember all of it. You're in an agreement with the state. Your your marriage is with the state and your spouse. Your marriage is with the state and the spouse. So basically, you're asking the government for permission to get married. Right. You right. should just be asking. Right. Here, here's the thing. The government has a legitimate concern uh, for the health and safety of everybody in the county or in the state to know, you know, who's married to who and who ch what children belong to, you know, who. They have a legitimate concern for health, safety, and welfare, stuff like that. So what you should do is get married and notify them you didn't get married. You don't ask them to get married. You tell them you did. Yeah. Okay? So you get married, and you sign it. A lot of people say, we got married, but file it at the courthouse. You didn't ask for permission. That's exactly correct. You know, Abe Lincoln never had a marriage license. George Washington never had one. Were they married? Yeah. In the front of most family Bibles, I didn't look to see if this one has one, but most of the old family Bibles have, there we go, holy matrimony. And you know, if you fill this out and sign it and get witnesses to sign it, this is a legal document. You want to prove you're married? Bring the family Bible in, show it to them. See? Oh, wow, you're married, all right, okay. That's all it takes. That's it. End of story. Sign this, you're done. Well, except for <laughs> paying a lot of money for the next 80 years, you know, if you're married. But uh, uh, that's all that's required. But if you get a state marriage license, you don't realize you just entered into a contract with the state. Now, if they don't like the way you're raising your kids, they can come take them away. Why do you want the state involved in your marriage? But they make it really tough. The bank's going to say, oh, well, there's certain benefits you can't have unless you have a marriage license. See there? All this stuff ties together. They'll say you can't get a driver's license unless you have a social security number. Well, wait, 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 wait. Why do I need the social security number? Well, you can't get a driver's license. Well, then, why do I need the driver's license? So you can drive on the highway. No, no, no. You turn the key and you, you know, hit the gas and it'll, it'll go. Huh. You know, but you've got to have our license. Tennessee was having a big problem oh, eight or ten years ago because... Hundreds of people were sending in their driver's license and saying, we don't want your permission to drive. We have a God-given authority to drive. And so the cops were stopping them, you know, and they didn't know what to do with these guys. What's your driver's license? I don't have one. you got to have one. No, no. I have permission from God. I have a right. I have an un unalienable right that came from God to travel. <clears throat> and so finally the governor of Tennessee wrote a letter to all the uh, sheriffs and said, look, if you, if you stop someone... And they don't have a driver's license, don't ask them. They're perfectly within the law to drive without a license. Now, Bruce, a guy in Canada named Bruce uh, Woodford, uh, sent in his driver's license and his uh, uh, license plate to the Canadian government and <laughs> said, I, I don't want these anymore. Uh, I, I paid these under contract, but it was not fraudulent. I didn't know all the details about this. He's got a very fascinating letter. I don't know where I put it, it's on my website somewhere about the letter from Bruce Woodford about uh, when he was called into court, he stopped him, of course, and issued three citations. He issued the citation to Bruce Woodford with all capital letters, which is a corporation, of course, another long story. He went into court, did not go in front of the bar, When the judge called his name, he stood outside and said, Your Honor, I'm Bruce Woodford, but uh, I'm getting a lot of mail for a corporation named Bruce Woodford. Apparently this corporation's in trouble, you know, no, no driver's license, etc., but I'm a natural born person. Do you need me for anything? 
And the judge says, step a little closer so I can hear you. Yeah, right. Step a little closer so I can enter into your jurisdiction is what you mean, judge. And so he said, no, that's okay. I'll speak louder, Your Honor. He said, go through the same thing again. I'm Bruce Woodford, you know, a natural-born Canadian citizen. And according to the law, you know, and he read the law to him. He said, a real person is flesh and blood. Canadian is, you know, first letters capital, next letters are small, and, you know, but a corporation is all capital letters. He said, I'm not a corporation, but you need me for anything, Your Honor. The judge said, let me think about this for a minute. And he said, no, you can go. He let him go. Uh, I've got the whole letter. It's a fascinating story. I can look it up for you if you'd like it. The fact is, we have rights that come from the Creator. The government wants to turn our rights like the right to drive, the right to get married, the right to preach, the right to have a church. They want to turn those rights into privileges. Privileges is something they grant you. Is the Fifth Amendment a right or a privilege? Think about that. You have the right to remain silent. They say nothing. Yeah, that's a right. People talk about my Fifth Amendment privileges. No, 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 no. It's a Fifth Amendment right. Okay. That's why the, the states didn't want to ratify the Constitution. So they had those things spelled out. We want to know that it's real clear, you know. We're not going to ratify this Constitution unless we get some basic things spelled out in writing. We have certain rights, and this is going to be clear. Right. 75% of kids who are raised in Christian homes who go off to public schools will reject the Christian faith after one year of college. I think it's because the books aren't really books about science anymore. They're books about evolution. There's an incredible indoctrination program kids go through that causes them to lose their faith. And very few make it through. Christian kids should have known better, but they lost their faith. We'll take about a five-minute break. When we get back, we'll talk about the close-up and seminar part one. Okay, let's uh, finish up. Uh, anything else we need to discuss on the age of the earth? The evidences that I use are evidences from Scripture. The Bible clearly teaches about 6,000 years old. There's a lot of evidence from space that says the earth is not billions of years old. There's evidence from the earth itself that it's not billions of years old. Stalactite formation, you know, spin of the earth, etc. There's evidence from living systems that indicate they're not billions of years old. You know, the coral reef, the oldest uh, tree, etc. There's evidence from history. The earth is not billions of years old. So there are many major groups of evidences you can use to say, look, I think the coins in the box would indicate this is not billions of years old. Like the illustration we gave, you find a coin in the box, a sunken ship, you know, you can pretty much limit when the boat sank based on the evidence there. Okay, uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit, start covering what's on seminar uh, number two of my series. It only took us nine weeks to get through part one. Uh, what was it like before the flood came? The Bible clearly teaches they lived to be over 900 years old. First of all, how on earth can you live to be 900? Is this really true? Did they really live to be 900? What was different back then? What was the Garden of... I'm going I'm to say Garden of Eden, though technically that's just one spot. By that I mean the whole pre-flood time frame. For that 1,650 years from the creation to the flood, what was it like? Average age before the flood is 900. And I tell folks in my seminar, you could learn a lot in 900 years. Keep in mind, Adam came pre-programmed straight from the hand of God. The guy could walk, talk, name all the animals, and get married first day. Incredibly high IQ. Who knows? IQ 400, pick a number, you know, way up there, beyond anything we've ever seen. Okay? Think how much knowledge <coughs> he had, had, had pre-programmed into him to begin with, and he walked and talked with God for probably 100 years before they sinned. That's my guess. I'll show you why later on here in this class. I think they lived in the garden <clears throat> for a long time, 100 years before they sinned. But whatever it was, he got to walk and talk with God for some time. That's an incredible thought. Um, and he lived long enough to pass this information on to his great, 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 great grandson. Think how many things are lost to knowledge, you know. They say the Greeks discovered the value of pi no, the Greeks rediscovered the value of pi, 3.14159. They didn't discover it. All kinds of things have been known from ancient past that are just now being rediscovered. I don't know how advanced they were before the flood, but I have wondered if they had space flight. People say, well, if, you know, if man lived forever on the earth, wouldn't he fill it up with people and pretty soon be overcrowded? Well, correct. If nobody ever died 
that would eventually become a problem. Now you've got to consider a couple of factors in there though. Today the earth is only 3% habitable. 97% of this earth is uninhabitable. Deserts, ice caps, underwater, 70% of it right there. So if 90% of the earth was habitable before the flood, that would allow a population of several hundred billion people could live here on the earth with no problem. And maybe God's plan was, okay, once you get this one full, we're going to send a colony off to, you know, the next one. Who knows? Just a thought. In that case, since this current estimate is there's enough stars that everybody can own 11 trillion to yourself, it would take a while to populate all that. Assuming, of course, there are worlds around those stars. We don't know that there are, but, I mean, uh, that may have been God's big plan. But the average age before the flood is 912 if you throw out Methuselah. I mean, if you throw out Enoch. If you want to include Enoch in there, the average age is much higher because Enoch never died. He's nearly 6,000 years old now. Now, to put his, average his number in there, you've got a really big number. It's going to throw everything off. But uh, textbooks say dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. <clears throat> Did they? Or have dinosaurs always lived with man? So, <clears throat> in these sessions, we're going to talk about what the original creation was like, what did they eat before the flood, what was their diet, what will it be like in the thousand-year reign of Christ when the Lord fixes things back like they used to be. He promises He's going to restore the world like it used to be. So what we're about to study is gone, but we're going to see it again one day. Where did all the water for the flood come from and where did it go? I was in my first debate I did, University of West Florida. One of the students in the audience during Q&A time, he said, hey, if there's a worldwide flood, where'd all that water go? Fair question. I said, well, it's still here. The oceans are gigantic. Anybody ever flown over either ocean, Atlantic or Pacific? Man, it's incredible. You can fly for hour after hour after hour, just incredible amounts of water out there. I flew over to Pacific coming back from Australia. Man, what a long flight. At five, actually, the pilot came on. He said, folks, we are caught in the jet stream. We have a 200 mile an hour tailwind. We're going 750 miles an hour. That's moving. And it still took us forever to get across that big pond. I thought, man, oh man, what a lot of water down there. It's incredible the amount of water in the oceans. And if you smoothed out the earth, the water would be about a mile and a half deep everywhere. Plenty to drown in. So where'd all the water go? Hey, it's still here. It's in big puddles called oceans, okay? And Psalm, 1, Psalm 104 answers all that about the mountains rising up, the valleys sinking down, the water rushing off. The water for the flood is still on the surface, just collected in big puddles. Okay. And were there really giant people over 10 feet tall on this earth? Yes, there were. We're going to try to get to all that in this session, in this next five years. Okay. Second Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Have you ever had to work with or, or talk to a scoffer, somebody who scoffs at the Bible? Man, I get them all the time. Why do they scoff? The Bible says they're walking after their own lust. The reason they scoff is because of their lust. I've never seen an exception to that. I was at University of North Florida in Jacksonville. I did a debate with uh, two professors there, and they refused to allow me to videotape it. They said, if you have a video camera here, we're, we're not, we won't debate. We're leaving. Okay. But it was a really good debate. It was fun. Two on one. I'll be glad to go back there any day. Afterwards, we had a Q&A time, and I was talking to one of the students there from the university. He said, evolution is a fact. It's a fact. I said, son, now calm down just a minute. Let me ask you a question. Suppose creation were true. Just suppose. Suppose this book is absolutely correct. Suppose God made the world. And like he said he did, and he's the boss, and he's going to come judge the world. I said, would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the book indicates right here that uh, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, no adultery, no premarital sex, no pornography. Uh, would that affect your lifestyle? He said, you're trying to embarrass me. I said, I don't know anything about you. I'm just asking you a question. If this book's true, would that affect your lifestyle? He said, yeah. I said, now, be honest with me. Have you accepted evolution because you know of some scientific reason to accept it? Or have you accepted evolution because of your lifestyle? Got him right between the eyes. 
There's no scientific reason to, to reject this book or to accept that stupid theory. But they walk, they scoff because of their lust. And I bring this up on the radio program all the time. I get scoffers that call in, you know, and argue for a while on a radio program. And I'll, I'll ask them questions like, hey, if the book was true, would this affect your lifestyle? You know, would you have to cancel any subscriptions to Playboy or Penthouse or something like that? Yeah, never seen an exception. It's always the case. The reason they scoff is because of their lust. You can count on it. Second Peter said so. The scoffers are going to say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Boy, that's an important phrase. We'll cover more on that on seminar tape number four whenever we get there. But the next verse says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. It does not really, by the way, that's a joke, okay? I don't speak any Greek. Well, a little bit. Eladoski lo means come here, pooch, in Greek. That's about it for me, okay? Uh, but um, the scoffers are willingly ignorant. They're dumb on purpose <coughs> of two things. Number one, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Two things you can see in this. God made the heavens by His Word. He spoke, and every molecule appeared and got organized, brought into existence out of nothing. That's a phenomenal thought, okay? He spoke, and every molecule came into existence, got in the right place, and began obeying His command of whatever it's supposed to do. If it's a salt molecule or an iron molecule or a gold molecule, it just all appeared by His Word. He didn't lift a finger to build this universe. Didn't turn one screw, didn't pound one nail, didn't saw one board, spoke. You can think about that the rest of your life and never understand that. That's an incredible statement. But notice it says heavens. Heaven is plural. The heavens were of old. There is more than one heaven. If your Bible is properly translated like a King James should be, and it is in most cases, some, even some of the King James people try to help in the printers say, oh, let's fix that. You know, they add a few things here when they, in the printed edition. But Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, can anybody quote that? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created the heaven and the earth. Singular, the heaven. Now here it says heavens. Well, which is it? Actually, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it's heaven, singular, but almost all new versions have said heavens. Okay, they've changed it. Major mistake. Uh, it means expanded place. From the surface of the earth all the way out was one heaven. Then later he divides it into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. So every, almost every other reference refers to um, heavens. Let me do a word search real quick in a Bible program and let's see uh, how many times heaven appears versus how many times heavens appear. Okay, H-E-A-V-N appears 551 times. Heavens appears uh, 127 times. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in Genesis chapter 2. But Genesis chapter 1 is heaven singular. Okay, so by the time he gets done with day 6, it's now heavens plural. That's the way it should be. Okay, who cares? Well, maybe it's a minor point, but we'll bring that more up on that later in part 7, about nine years from now when we get to that. So, heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. They don't want to understand. They like being stupid about the creation and the flood. Next, coming up next. The creation of the heavens and the earth, right here in verse 5, is the first thing they're ignorant of. The second thing says whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. This is an obvious reference to Noah's flood. Now, an amazing number of Christians, to me it's an amazing number, uh, believe there was a Lucifer's flood. You ever heard of that before? God created the world and then Lucifer fell from heaven and destroyed it and there was a Lucifer, and they talk, they say this is Lucifer's flood. There's no mention anywhere in the Bible of Lucifer's flood. It didn't happen. It violates numerous scriptures, which we'll show you later. Uh, that's part of the gap theory, which is totally not true. Verse uh, 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the, Peter, talking in Peter's time, the heavens and the earth, which we now see, by the same word, that's the word of God, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There's a judgment coming. 
So the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation. They don't want to admit God created the world because that would mean uh, he owns it, which might mean, you know, there are some rules. They don't want those rules. They don't want to admit there was a flood because that is proof positive God has the authority to judge his creation. It's his world. He can wreck it any time he feels like it. And that flood is proof. And Satan doesn't want you looking at the rocks and minerals and thinking, wow, judgment of God. He wants kids looking at the rocks and minerals thinking, wow, millions of years ago. And he's worked really hard to spread this propaganda that the rocks and fossils we see are evidence of millions of years when actually they're evidence of God's judgment. You can see these dead creatures fossilized here and say, man, they died because of Adam and Eve's sin. That's why they died. They're also ignorant of the coming judgment. I like that bumper sticker that said, Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. Well, sadly, most Christians are also ignorant of those same three things. They don't understand the creation. They don't understand that flood. And they don't understand God's coming soon to judge them. So, well, I don't want to be ignorant of those things. I want to understand as much as possible. Now, some things cannot be known about, you know, some of these events. But on this session, we're going to talk about the creation. And then later when we get to seminar part six, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the flood. What would a worldwide flood do to the world? What, what would the evidence be if, the, if there was a worldwide flood? I like that song they sing on, uh, Buddy Davis sings, you know. If there was a worldwide flood, what would the evidence be? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find? Billions of dead things laid down, buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. That's exactly what, what the evidence would be. So, some Christians have, are ignorant of the creation and the flood, and it's caused them to compromise the Bible. And that's what I want to talk about in this session. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. King James Bible uses the word the. Now, it took me a long time, okay? I was dragged slowly, kicking and screaming, into the King James camp, okay? I was certainly not raised that way. Uh, and I don't fight Christians that aren't there yet. I tell them, hey, keep reading the Bible, keep studying. When you get to the top of the mountain of truth, you'll be an independent Baptist in the King James camp, okay? That's how you know you made it all the way to the top. <laughs> but if you're not there yet, you can still be my friend. I'll still take you to lunch. Come on over, I'll give you a tour. Uh, but it was the first day. Many new Bible versions have made serious changes besides just some of the words. They left out stuff, like they left out the blood in many cases. NIV, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians or Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption. King James says, whom we have redemption through his blood. Well, why did they leave out the blood? Well, they don't want to offend anybody. They want to sell more Bibles. It goes back to money, okay? Every time it goes back to money. Okay, um, some have left out whole verses. We cover much more on why King James on video number seven. And again, again, if you're not King James, it's perfectly fine. You do whatever you want to do. But I think if you really study the issue honestly, you'll have to say there are real serious problems. We cover that on video seven. When I was uh, 10 years old, I believe, my family started going to the United Methodist Church in Morton, Illinois. And it just happened at that time to have an extremely liberal pastor who did not believe in heaven or hell and did not believe the Bible is the word of God. And, you know, nice guy, very sociable guy, just didn't believe the Bible, you know. I don't know what they have for a pastor now. I haven't been there in many, many, many years, 30 years, 35 years. Uh, but for perfect attendance in the fourth grade at the Methodist Church, I was given a revised standard version of the Bible, RSV. I still have it on my shelf in there. In the RSV, it says, God called the light, this is Genesis 1-5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Verse 8 says it was a second day. Verse 13 says it was a third day. What, is there a difference between one day and the first day? Yeah. Almost all the new versions, and you can check it out, NASB, New Living Translation, Amplified Bible, RSV, ASV, Almost all of them have changed it to say one day. Why would they do that? That's one reason why most people do most things. Money. They want to sell more books. They don't want to offend people who believe the earth is billions of years old. 
and the first day is really definite, and that bothers them. We don't have the authority to change God's Word. We have the authority to preach God's Word. We have the authority to print God's Word and give copies to other people. We have the authority to teach about it, but we don't have the authority to change it. I think it's a serious thing if you're going to change God's Word. Anyway, these folks who do most of these new versions believe in what's called the gap theory. How many have ever heard of the gap theory before? I had only been saved for a short time. I'm going to say probably a month. And I was riding the bus. I was a bus kid to Bethel Baptist Church in Pekin, Illinois. And I was bringing my Methodist Bible, my revised, reviled substandard perversion of the Bible. And my pastor very wisely said, Brother Kent, you need to get a Bible. I said, I got a Bible. I've been reading it for an hour a day, man. I'm a brand new Christian. I'm on fire. You know, I'm loving it, soaking it up, you know, reading my Bible. He said, no, you need to get a Bible. I said, I got a Bible. He said, no, you need to get a Schofield Reference Edition, King James Bible. I said, okay. So reluctantly, I gave up my RSV and got a Schofield Reference Edition, which I still have in my library there. And it's really ratty looking. If you pick it up, it falls apart. I've worn out several Schofield Bibles. Well, the first thing you come to in the Schofield Bible is his footnote on Genesis 1.1. Anybody have a Schofield Bible and read the reference there? You know what I'm talking about. Schofield says there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Here I was, brand new Christian, reading my Bible like mad, learning the Bible, studying, going to church, you know, singing the songs, and cha total change in my life. But I got a Schofield Bible. Probably set me back 15 years in my Christianity from that footnote in chapter 1, verse number 2. Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And Schofield says there's a gap in here, maybe even billions of years. So then I had been saved for, let's see, a couple years, and I went off to college, Midwestern Baptist College. Good school. Dr. Malone just turned 90 a couple days ago. He was the pastor there, started the church years ago, pastored the same church for like, 60 years. It's a long time to pastor a church. He started Midwestern Baptist College. And when I was there, there were like 500 students there. I think there's, you know, only like 80 or 100 now. But one of the books we had to study from was a great big, huge book I still got in the library called Explore the Book by J. Sidlow Baxter. Excellent book in many, many ways. But Sidlow Baxter also teaches the gap theory. And so that's what I was taught going through Bible college. And so I basically ignored the creation evolution issue because I didn't have an answer. Sidlow Baxter says in his book on page 35, between the first two verses of Genesis, there is ample scope for all the geologic eras. He says there was a pre-Adamite rebellion and the judgment of Lucifer and associated angel beings took place. Well, now wait just a minute. Was anybody here before Adam? And when did Lucifer get judged? See, the gap theory people teach, verse 1 says God created the earth, and then right after that there was a catastrophe when Satan fell from heaven and destroyed the earth, and God had to fix it back for six days. So the story is, they call it the ruin restoration. It got ruined when Satan fell from heaven, and it got restored over the next six days as God, now this is millions of years later maybe, and they say all these fossils we find in the earth are from this Lucifer's flood that took place right here between verse 1 and verse 2. That's why most of the people who believe in a, uh, a old earth do not believe in a worldwide flood in the days of Noah. Either it's a local flood or it's a tranquil flood. In other words, the water came up, killed everybody, went down, didn't leave a trace. No evidence from this flood. The tranquil flood theory and the uh, local flood theory are two things that are usually taught by people who believe the earth is billions of years old. So, James Hutton back in uh, 1775, wrote a book called The Theory of the Earth. In that book, James Hutton said the earth is millions of years old. Wow, well, that's kind of a new thought for the Western mind. The earth is millions of years old. That kind of, it is. Then people began teaching this pretty strongly in the late 1700s. They said, oh, the earth is millions of years old. Wow. And so it really took the Christians by surprise. They didn't know how to handle this. And so they said, well, how, do we, how do we make the Bible say that? So to give you the historical perspective of this gap theory, 
James Hutton's book comes out in 1795 and says the earth is millions of years old. Many people believed it. I mean, like most Christians believed it too. After all, science was teaching it, so it must be true. So about 20 years later, James or Thomas Chalmers, a Scottish theologian and uh, Masonic Lodge member, maybe there's a connection there, uh, Thomas Chalmers comes along and invents a brand new theory called the gap theory. And he's going to says, we're going to make the Bible teach the earth is billions of years old. Yes, scientists have just discovered this, that the earth is billions of years old, so it must be in the scripture somewhere. You don't ever need to try to accommodate some new scientific discovery to God's word, okay? That's, it, the Bible is going to be correct and science is going to be proven wrong eventually if there's a conflict, I can assure you. The gap theory says, verse 2 starts off with a redestroyed earth and God's going to fix it. And the earth was without form and void. And the gap theory folks will point out the word was here, the earth was without form, is the Hebrew word uh, hava, and it's used uh, within the same thing in Lot's wife. Lot's wife turned around and she hava a pillar of salt. She became a pillar of salt. And here they say it's the word was, and they say, you'll see a footnote that says, this better, would be better translated, became. The earth became without form and void. Anytime somebody says, well, the King James translators should have translated it this way. You know, they've had one year or two years of Hebrew in college, and these guys had a total accumulation of probably 200 years of Hebrew, and they knew the Hebrew extremely well, okay? Uh, but they want to correct these guys who didn't know. They deliberately chose the word was instead of the word became. The earth simply was without form and void. It didn't become without form and void. That's the way it was. Example here. Um, somebody's going to build a house. So they drive up with the truck and they dump off a load of lumber. The truck drives off. You walk up and you say, hey, what happened to your house? I'm not done yet. There's no form. I don't see a house here. I see a pile of lumber. That's correct. I have, I'm not done yet. It doesn't mean destroyed. So God simply wasn't done. The Hebrew words tohu wabohu mean unformed and unfilled. Now, I'm one of those guys who slowly has come around to believe you don't need the Hebrew to explain the English, okay? You can read the English just fine and understand. I'm not against going to the Hebrew. I'm not against concordances. But I'd be real cautious when somebody tries to correct the word that God promised he would preserve, okay? It does not necessarily mean destroyed, though it can mean destroyed. But it doesn't necessarily. Uh, tohu is used 20 times in the Old Testament with 10 different meanings. Ye seek me in vain. Isaiah 45. That's the word tohu. He stretcheth the earth over the empty place. Over the tohu. Job 26. It just simply means empty. But it, see, it can mean lots of different things. We have English words that mean a lot of different things. One word has all kinds of different meanings. Um, like the word for. F-O-R. I don't know how many meanings are in the dictionary, but it's quite a few. If I say, uh, George is in jail for stealing cars, what does the word for mean? Because. Now, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Does that mean the baptism is taking away your sin, or does that mean you get baptized because your sins have been taken away? It would have to mean because in order to fit with all the other verses in the Bible. See, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, 1 Peter uh, 1.20. So you always look at one and say, okay, what do the rest of them say? And let's make sure there's no conflict here. And I think they totally misinterpret the Acts 2.38 passage by saying it has to mean, you know, you get baptized be and to take away your sins. No, you get baptized because your sins have already been taken away. That's my take on the verse. Um, so, Tohu used 20 times 10 different meanings to the word tohu. Bill Clinton, as corrupt and vile as he was, was right when he said, what do you mean by is? Because is, in the law dictionary, has 18 different definitions. What is is? Okay. There's a good book in our library called uh, Unformed and Unfilled. You can buy this for uh, 8 bucks off the website. Uh, it's 222 pages about going down deep, staying down long, coming up dry in the Hebrew about the gap theory. 
or you can get my shorter Reader's Digest version. This is an example. One of the course requirements we have here is for you to write a summary of one of the books that we offered on the age of the earth, and there's a list of several you should have gotten with your class. Steve Lowell took my class some time ago, and uh, he wrote a summary of the gap theory for his course requirements, okay? It was excellent. I called him up in Tennessee. I said, Brother Steve, this summary you wrote for the class is, is, is awesome. Can I add some stuff to this and tweak it? And let's publish this as a little booklet. He said, that'd be great. I'd be honored, Brother Hovind. So anyway, we worked together on this for quite a while, and it's about only 40 pages, I think, or something. But it really summarizes the problems with the gap theory. Anyway, the booklet's two bucks if you want to get that. So as you write summaries of other books for your course requirements, that's one of the things I hope to use them for. Uh, we'll publish it, put your name on there, make you world famous, and, uh, and I'll make some money off it selling it for two bucks. Right? <laughs> of course, i got to print them all. Uh. This house is unformed and unfilled. Nobody's living in it, and it's not done. Has it been destroyed? No. This is an example of tohu wabohu, unformed and unfilled. It's just empty. Nobody's there yet. It does not mean destroyed. Now, there is a Jeremiah passage. Jeremiah chapter 4 is the only other place in the Bible where the phrase, without form and void, is found. And in this case, it is quite obviously talking about a city that has been judged. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. Let's go back and look at the Jeremiah chapter 4 passage in the Bible. And let's just read around this just a little bit. I'm going to type on my Bible search engine here, um, without form and void. Appears twice. Genesis 1, 2 and Jeremiah 4, uh, 23. Only two places the phrase appears. Now, if you read the whole passage in Jeremiah, God starts off in verse 1, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. And he goes on talking about the judgments he's going to do to Jer Judah and Jerusalem. If you don't obey me, you know, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, verse 5, Declare ye it in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go unto the defensed cities. You can read the whole passage is talking about you guys, you better obey or I'm going to judge you. This is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, saying, please obey God or he's going to have to send judgment. Please obey God. Uh, then uh, verse 10, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth. I mean, I challenge you to read the whole chapter and you'll see it's pretty obvious. This is God talking about Jerusalem and Judah and you're going and, and Israel, and you're going to be judged. Uh, verse 20, destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children, and they have, done under, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the truthful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, I will not make a full, yet I will not make a full end." You can read the chapter for yourself, folks. This is obviously talking about a judgment coming on Israel. This passage has nothing to do with the creation. Nothing whatsoever. So just because they use the same phrase, without form and void, some people say, oh, see, it must be talking about the creation. That's ludicrous. There are all kinds of places in the Bible where phrases are used that over and over that mean something totally different. Now, this house is unformed and unfilled. Nobody's living in it, and in this case, it has been destroyed. Exodus 20 says pretty clearly in verse 11 in the Ten Commandments, In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. The 
question is not what does it say, but do you mean, do you believe what it says? Can you think of anything that would not be included? Exodus 20, 11. Everything in heaven, he made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Would that include the angels? Angels had to be made during those six days. Would that include Lucifer? That's everything. For those who say Lucifer fell before the creation, they got a real serious problem because Lucifer was created. It says so twice. He was a created being. And if everything's created in six days, then Lucifer was created during those six days. It's pretty simple. And he rested on the seventh day. Exodus 31. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. We're talking about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign for the children of Israel. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Again, real clear. Did it in six days. And in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, the seventh day God ended his work, and he rested on the seventh day. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day because he rested from all his work which he created and made. By the way, created and made are used interchangeably all through Scripture. We'll get into that in a little bit here. Uh, Hebrews 4, 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day. There it is again, the seventh day. If there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, this is not the seventh day. It's the X number, you know, bazillionth day or whatever it is. It's not the seventh day, that's for sure. So, all these verses would have to be thrown out for the gap theory to be true. The Bible teaches real clearly, by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So tell me, why do we have death in the world? Because of Adam's sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now why did the Schofield Bible say there was a pre-Adamite rebellion? Well, who are these pre-Adamites and what happened to them? They'll say, oh, they died when Satan fell from heaven. Oh, stop right there. Stop, stop, stop. You can't have death before sin. You've got a problem here. By man came death. By man came the resurrection. In Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible's real clear. We have death in the world because of Adam's sin. And death is an enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. People say, didn't plants die? Wouldn't Adam eat the apple and kill the, kill the apple? No. Plants aren't alive in the biblical sense. We'll get into that much later in video number seven. By the way, I've got to change that, I think. I put that on video seven now. Let me fix that typo there. Okay. Praise God for PowerPoint. I used to have a slide projector. Oh, man, when you made a change there, my kids hated it. When I said, hey, kids, I'm going to add three more slides at the beginning, we'd sit around for an hour, and everybody had to move all the slides three slots over. I had like 12 carousels of slides. <laughs> okay. Genesis 1.28. God blessed him and said, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. First command to God, Adam, have a bunch of kids. And people say, wait, 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 the word replenish means fill again. And you can look it up in any dictionary. Almost all of them will say replenish, ver VT, verb transitive, make full again. Hmm. Well, that's a 2004 dictionary, I believe. 21st century dictionary. The King James translators 400 years ago came across the word male in English, I mean in Hebrew, which means fill. So they chose the word replenish because that's all the word meant in 1611. The word replenish was the common English word to say fill. Would you please replenish my water supply? Just go fill it. That's all it means. In 1650, a guy named Francis Bacon added a second dictionary definition to the word. By 1650, the word replenish meant fill, and it meant refill, both. Two, two meanings. But for hundreds of years, the primary word, meaning of the word, was fill. Here's an 1828 dictionary. It's in the library. Replenish. To fill. That's all it means. Secondary meaning. Recover former fullness. You see that name at the end of that line? Who added that to the dictionary? Bacon, Francis Bacon. So, replenish had two meanings in 1828. The primary meaning was fill. Secondary meaning is fill again. In 1891, this dictionary is in the library there. 
By the way, we, we collect old dictionaries. If anybody can get me any old dictionaries from 17 or 1800s, I'd love to get them for our library. We do research on stuff like this, so please get them for me. In 1891, the word replenish meant fill. Secondary meaning was fill again or recover former fullness. Now watch this. 1892 is when the switch was made. Keep in mind, Darwin's book came out, 1859. 30 years later, Evolution was a really popular theory. And people started changing things to make everything fit the theory. 1892 is when the switch was made, as far as I can see, in the Webster's Dictionary. Replenish means to fill up again. Wait, wait, wait. Fill again, and then it says fill completely. They still have both definitions of the word, but they've switched the order. You see that? 1891. Fill was first, fill again was second, now fill again is first, and fill is second. Hmm. 1989, replenish, to make full or complete again. They have totally taken out what used to be the primary meaning of the word. Today, you are correct to say the word replenish means fill again. That is correct. English words change meanings all the time. When I was a kid, the word cool meant not hot. <laughs> what does it mean today? Who knows, right? Awesome? Cool means awesome, huh? <laughs> Think about it. How can cool mean awesome? When I was a kid, the word gay meant happy. You remember those old times? Yeah. Diane, you remember that? Oh, yeah. You were there, okay. Uh, <laughs> things have changed, right? James 2, 3. You have respect him that weareth the gay clothing. Would you agree that would probably not be something you'd want to say to somebody today? Robert, you have gay clothing on. Yeah, bam. <laughs> gay meant happy, exciting, wow. You know, that's changed meanings, okay? Uh, Paul said in Romans 1, I would have come to you, but I was let hitherto. The word let used to mean hindered. Actually, the word let had quite a few different meanings, one of which was hindered. We don't ever use it for that today. Yes, sir? It's like the word uh, in Psalms. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I've always, I had a problem with that when I was a little kid. I shall not want, yes. Says, I shall not want. To me, it meant, I shall not want, you know? Ah, okay. Want, well, the famous it, poem, it, you know, for want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, a war was lost, you know, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Words change meanings. And they're changing all the time today, you know. Uh, God promised he would settle his word in heaven forever, Psalm 119. His word is going to be preserved. He did not promise to preserve our language. Our language is going corrupt. But in 1611, the word replenish meant fill. And if you're going to read a book written in 1611, you'd have to use a 1611 dictionary to see what they meant back then. It's totally stupid to use that as evidence for a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Now, if there's a gap in there, which we'll get into later, this is not one of the evidences for it. Okay? Lucifer had to be created. We'll take up right there next week when we get back. Lucifer, when did he live? When did he fall from heaven? When did he sin? And what happened because of that fall? What was that Garden of Eden like? When we get back next week.